It's called it's called to order and being recorded in accordance with the open meetings law. It's a practice to conduct remote meetings with all committee members, cameras on, and public attendees leave the camera on when you're speaking. I'll let you know which topics are open for comment by community members, committee members, board members, the public. Um, if you have questions that fall out of this uh, public comment time, please put that in a chat and we will try to address. We are committed to providing access. If you require accommodations, please contact the district office 72 hours prior and please use plain language and speak at a moderate pace. So thank you for allowing me to read that. Okay, so I'd like to um, hold a roll call of our committee members. So I will start on Betty Feibush. I'm chair of this committee. Um, and I'll call on Ellis to introduce herself. Each person can call on another person to introduce themselves, I think. Will work. Good evening, everybody. My name is Ellis Scope. I'm a member of this committee and a member of the board. And I call on Santia. Hello, good evening. My name is Santia Felicia. I am a committee member and board member, and I call on Leroy. Hi, my name is Leroy Lee. I am a committee member and board member, um, and I will pass it to Nick. Hi, good evening, everybody. Uh, Nick Ferreira, I am a committee and board member, and I will toss it over to, I'm losing people, Samantha, Sam? I think Ms. Johnson is just getting off a train, so she might not be available. Okay, so we'll introduce her later. Is there anyone else on the committee that hasn't been recognized yet? I think we're okay. Okay, so the next part of the agenda is the adoption of the agenda. And I would like to call for a slight modification. Since our current issue in the community is around the, uh, the situation with the Madison uh, Boys and Girls Club, uh, I would like to have those, uh, uh, the, the director and staff speak immediately following the presentation and Q and Q&A from Los Soros. Uh, rather than having it at the end of the meeting. Uh, is there any objection to this by members of the committee? Hearing none, we'll change the order of the uh, agenda a bit. Okay, um, so our open session is for, if there's any comments just on the agenda items uh, from the community. And the agenda, the official agenda item is, is the Los Soros. So that's what, uh, if there's any comments on that. Uh, I don't see any hands. So we will go on to the presentation and Q and A from our uh, agenda, agenda speakers. They're from the Southside United Los Soros. HDFC organization. They are a youth services coordination project. And I believe we have Juan Ramos and Esteban Duran. So um, we welcome your presentation to our committee. Good evening, everyone. Um, just wanna thank the board for having us tonight. Um, we appreciate the time you've allowed it to us. Um, I also want to make mention that we do have another member of our team, Erica, um, is also on the call. Um, so that there's three of us here. Uh, she's the one with the cute baby and the big cheeks. <laughs> um, so um, what we wanted to do tonight is um, present to you on what we call the Youth Service Coordination Project, um, which is a pilot project that's being piloted across um, many NYCHA developments across Brooklyn um, and also in Manhattan, in Harlem, the Lower East Side, Staten Island, and also the Bronx. Um, the pilot program um, serves um, 12 
to 15 year olds and 16 to 19 year olds um, who are in need of supportive services and are dual system involved, meaning that they're impacted by multiple systems in their lives. They can either be um, going through issues in um, criminal court, family court, while also simultaneously maybe being something like truant on parole, probation, and anything else that impacts their lives. Um, the aim of the program is to provide them with direct mentorship, um, and that direct mentorship um, comes via support systems that include a navigator to help them navigate multiple systems, um, a case manager that will help them with case management services, and a social worker assigned to the, to the young person um, throughout the entirety of the time. Um, one of the key features to this program, unlike others, is that while we're also providing services directly to the young person impacted, um, the program also provides direct service to the family. The belief here is that if you provide direct services to the family as well, you can increase the likelihood of that young person overcoming the system involvement they have um, by addressing issues impacting the family directly. Um, so we can help the family with everything um, from, let's say the family's dealing with joblessness, food insecurity, or any of those things. Um, we're able to assist them and connect them directly to services um, so that they can then become part of our team and helping the young person in their lives be more successful. Um, again, this is a pilot program um, that will be evaluated eventually um, to see if it can be duplicated across the city. Um, so, you know, what our, our role here is as the lead organization is to implement the, the project um, and also um, document how this process takes place so that the city can then evaluate and see whether or not um, it's gonna, it can make a difference across the nights of developments across the city. Um, key components to the, to the program also include um, family support in the way of um, providing family stipends to help them with immediate needs. Um, so for example, the family is in need of um, uh, you know, uh, diapers or anything like that, we help immediately. Um, it also provides a stipend for the young person that's involved in the program. Um, and the key to it though, is the coordination of services with city agencies. Um, so we have direct access to those city agencies that sometimes are in the lives of the young people in our communities. Um, and the key here is to make sure that navigating those agencies and, and, and systems um, doesn't become more of a burden than it should. Um, because sometimes with the best of intentions, young people are assigned to different um, types of um, uh, city agencies to receive services. And those services sometimes have no communication with each other. And that's where we come in to try to coordinate those services, make sure that they're working you know, on behalf of the young person and their family in order for them to, see, to be successful. Um, so here, you don't pass the buck. Um, you don't check off, I help them with food insecurity and pass them on to the next organization. We stay involved and make sure that every um, level of support is there and that everyone is playing a role in that. Um, and that's how we begin the coordination of services and also help the young person and their family um, learn to become advocates for themselves you know, with these agencies and these organizations that are involved in their lives. Um, so I'm going to kind of leave it there in case anyone on my team wants to jump in and, and add anything to it, and then we'll gladly take any questions that come up. Yes, uh, Juan, thank you. I just want to introduce myself. Um, Esteban, and I'm the Director of Technical Assistance for Los Sures for this Youth Services Coordination Project. Um, let me just also say that I was on a community board for 10 years, so I, I totally uh, appreciate your dedication to being on the board and serving you know, as volunteers. Sometimes these meetings take a lot of hours, and, um, um, but I always appreciate that, the work that you all do. Um, having been there myself in, in CB1 in, in Brooklyn. Uh, but um, you know, as Juan was just saying, he, he went over more of the details in terms of like the core aspects of the program, helping these youth you know, that are between 12 to 15 and 16 to 19. I just also wanna give a snapshot that um, uh, the Youth Services Coordination Project is also in several other boroughs. Um, we have two subcontractors that are doing the work. Um, one is doing it in Manhattan and the other one is doing it in the Bronx and Staten Island. Um, so all across, we, we are focusing on 27 developments um, across four boroughs as the pilot rollout. And um, in particular for, for CB2, 
um, um, uh, I think it's Farragut and Whitman are the two um, that that fall under your your um, your boundaries. And um, we uh, definitely want to focus on referrals, getting referrals um, from community members and trusted organizations that that uh, that that might know um, of a youth that could benefit from these services. And um, as Juan said, it's a really wraparound model um, to see how we could best support them and and and. We could go a little bit further in terms of the eligibility, multi-system stuff, but at the end of the day, as Juan said, we we're, we're there to support. It's not about just passing the buck and 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 uh, just saying you know we we helped them with what we did and, and move along. Um, and uh, um, one one key element, also my my apologies, um, is that um, you know folks that come to the to the program again, I just want to make sure that everybody understands they're they're paired with a navigator that's immediately providing the mentorship services and navigating systems for them. They're then also part of a team that has a case manager and a social worker. So the amount of um, support in place is, is key um, to this and is something that we haven't seen in other programs doing the city. And that's why they're trying to pilot it in this way, um, kind of taking from some of the elements that we've seen that worked and some of the elements that haven't been tried to see if if this um, approach um, is the difference that we need in order to help our young people. Thank you. Um, is there anyone else on your team who has remarks? Because then I will uh, start with a question and then open it up to my committee members. Anyone else on, on your team? Hi, my name is Erica. Hi. Yeah, this is my Hi, son. little one. <laughs> um, loves to be in all of my meetings. <laughs> um, and so I just wanted to say hello and, and welcome uh, questions. <laughs> Great, and we welcome the young person. Okay, so I want to start with a question, but then really open it up to my entire committee. Uh, if you could start with how do you get the referrals? How do they come into you? And how many are you uh, funded to uh, support? How many young people? That, that's a great question. Um, the, the program is referral based, obviously. So it's not like we're on the ground doing the work. This is why we're trying to reach out to the community board, trying to reach out to other organizations um, and also city agencies that are actually doing the wor um, work with some of these young people. Um, in order to support them. So it's all referral based at the moment. Um, and Erica and um, Stemma, correct me if I'm wrong, it's a pilot that looks to serve 135 young people. And from that sample, then it's gonna be evaluated um, to see um, the results. And then based on those results, um, again, the city will make its determination on whether or not a model like this can be then um, rolled out across the city. Can you be more specific about how you're getting these referrals? Well, like I said, we're coming from different community-based organizations that may be working with young people and they require more services. It could be from maybe even a local precinct who is trying to be you know, um, proactive instead of locking people up and locking young people up. They can say, we have someone who we constantly have contact with. Are you willing to work with them? Um, it could be your local organization that um, is working with the family, for example, um, through an ACS case um, and say, and lets us know like the young person can um, benefit from deeper mentorship services, can the family can benefit from your services to help them with food insecurity, job insecurity. So it could be, um, you know, multifaceted approach of how we get the, um, the uh, referrals. Okay, I, I have one more comment and then I'll open it up to my committee. Um, previously I was, uh, working in the DOE and student support. And I know that schools sometimes have a very, feel very con confidential, like they don't want to make referrals, they want to handle it from within uh, the support and the service that the school can do. Can you just call a school and then go there and say, we will refer this person, we would like to speak to them or their parent? Like, how do you, connect all those dots? Because I imagine you need the parents' uh, mm -hmm. approval on this. Yes, um, especially for the for the young people that are between the ages of 12 and 16 in particular. Um, we definitely need sign-offs from their parents. And um, it's all voluntary, by the way. It's not like people mm -hmm. are forced to come to the program. They have to volunteer to be in the program. 
Um, and because of the connection through the mayor's office on criminal justice and DYCD, um, we also have access to DOE and other folks that we can try to streamline some of that those circumstances that do come up. Um, and we've had instances, um, and Esteban can um, uh, you know chime in on this if he likes, but we've even had instances where um, we had a recent case, for example, where we had a young man and his family that were uh, you know dealing with an ACS case. Um, the ACS worker was trying to help and couldn't get the family together. Reached out to us, we were able to coordinate. And we had the family, you know, come in and we helped them, you know, from our office, um, navigate the services. And now they have the young person who was um, not coming to the meetings with the father in particular, coming to the to the meetings and um, participating in the meetings. And, and the father and he now are actively having conversations based on the support that was provided. Um, so just one quick example of how it can work out. It can work. Great. Um... Of course, I have other questions about my committee. Uh, so on my committee, just raise your actual hand and we'll call on you for any questions. Let's see. I was... Nick, I see yeah. your hand, Nick. I was waiting. I didn't know if Ellis was gonna have her hand up first. So I was waiting, but you're chewing, you're <laughs> chewing, enjoy. <laughs> Uh, thank you guys and, and, and Erica and, and with with a young one. I don't even know how you could show up and focus at all. I respect that so much. Um, really amazing work. I'm happy to hear this pilot exists. Uh, I work with DYCD in Queens. I noticed how that was left off the pilot list. So I'll uh, mm -hmm. maybe have a conversation with them later. Uh, mm -hmm. but, but really, re really awesome to hear that. So I do have a few um, specific questions. Um, you mentioned a few players, you know, social worker, caseworker, and a third uh, navigator, I think, if I got yes. that right. Mm -hmm. Who is providing that? Which organization is it? Is it through you? Is it a combination of the multiple partnerships, um, you know, that you referenced first? So that, that's my first question. Um, and then if you could tell me a little bit about how you would pair people or or if people aren't really gelling and, and things like that, mm -hmm. uh, what, what what that looks like? It's a great Thanks. question. Um, so each organization is responsible for hiring the navigator, the case manager, and the social worker. And the way we try to you do it at the moment, how do we pair them up is by geographic area. Um, so for example, you know, you have someone with Whitman and Farragut um, who will be taking care of that that bucket um, and working with the young people there and their families. Um, and can you repeat the second part of your question? And so, yeah, and so the second part, um, before before I get that, I'm just curious. So, th so that organization is going to hire three people, though. So Correct. it's not yes. only one person. So there is an opportunity if one of those players isn't my favorite person, I've got two other people, part of the team who can help me. Right. And, and we also have um, a navigator, case manager, and social worker assigned to another geographic area that can support um, should we okay. be, yeah. Okay. So and I guess that's kind of my question. If things weren't working out, you know, if yeah. you have a process, if somebody's like, I just don't, yeah. I don't like them. I don't want to, I don't want to meet it, with them. Yes. And there's also case conferencing that takes place amongst the team um, when things like that come up. Um, there's um, meetings where, again, with the young person and the family where that's also determined. And every week um, we, we talk about those cases and see what the needs are um, and see whether or not we need further support, which is where our funders come in. Um, you know, because they they provide access to all of the city, city agencies that may be involved and we can have direct access um, to those folks that are, again, in the lives of the young people we're trying to serve. Yeah, that, that sounds amazing. It sounds like, you know, Betty's point, there's certainly a lot of anxiety around even sharing this information, but it sounds like you guys can cut through the red tape or at least there are people who, who can be gone to to help people, right? Realize that you're all on the same team here, uh, right? And we don't have to, to hide the info. So so just last thing from me, um, you mentioned pilot and you're mentioning what sounds good to me of having to prove this works. So what, if anything, are you expected to show as outcomes uh, for young people and families as part of this pilot? Well, one, um, how, they, how they get into systems and how they're able to successfully exit those systems. Um, for families is, um, I think one of the key things that I'll share is that the program seeks to increase 
the protective factors for a family and a young person while decreasing the risk factors. So, you know, that in itself um, gives a, a great um, kind of like um, area for us to really consider what is successful and what's not. If a young person comes out of this, um, under, you know, in a better place um, where there may be, let's say, for example, um, truancy ends or um, we get them through their criminal court case, um, maybe the ACS um, case um, is looked at differently, you know, through the lens of the young person, um, you know, as opposed to what they believe is correct, right, um, by working with us and working with the family. Um, so it could be, you know, multiple things at once. Um, but I think the key that they're trying to see is whether or not a team in place like this to coordinate services can make the difference, the difference compared to how programs have rolled out in the past. Um, where they, again, they go with that checkoff system and say, oh, I helped them with this. Now let me pass them on to that group or that organization or that agency. Um, and, and that's where we believe the problem is um, that, you know, um, many of us, you know, uh, speaking from experience are passed, you know, passed on to system after system after system with no real um, support or um, anything that seems um tangible in place at the end of that. Thank you. Yeah. Ellis, did you have a question? Ellis? But of course I have a question. My... Good, good evening, Ellis. Great to good see evening. you. Good evening. I was being polite this evening and waiting for other people. Um, I am really interested in your work. I think I, uh, I used to do work that is kind of in that same direction. And um, for students, for young people and their families, they have to deal with really a complex situation with city agencies with overlapping, you might not even know. And um, dealing with that is really a lifelong skill, not only for the young people and their families who you'll be dealing with, but for all of us, right? It's a skill. And I'm wondering, um, um, what you are doing like programmatically to, to create independence and to create, you know, the ability for, for, for your clients or your, your, your whatever you, you're going to be calling them to be able to manage this on their own or, you know, to, to figure out when they're in over the head and may need to reach out and get some support. I'm pretty sure um, the team will jump in on this as well. Um, but one of the things I can say initially is that um, one of the things that, um, you know, we hope that comes out of this is that young people are hurt, right? Oftentimes what happens is that when systems are involved in their lives, um, when agencies in particular are involved in their lives, um, there's sort of like um, one playbook that fits all. And what we're saying is that that playbook sometimes doesn't get it right. And that we have to start with the young person in mind and then build from that. What is that young person actually going through? You know, we may say that we're helping them with truancy, but why is he being truant? Why is she being truant? Um, you know, what is happening with the family dynamic, right? Um, you know, uh, without giving names, you know, I can go back to another example of a recent case we had where, we, you know, we had a young man who um, was, you know, getting in trouble on the streets. He was placed on probation. The father's fearful for him, um, but he can't talk to him because the kid also happens to run away often, um, you know, and, you know, ACS and everybody else involved, no one was able to get them in the room, but because we went out there and started listening to this young man and what the needs were and why he feels he has a disconnect with his father, we were able to talk to the father and say, hey, this is why he's not listening to you. Are you willing to sit in a room with us and just listen to him, listen to his experience in this world, his experience at home, and also the peer pressure that he has in the community. And we it wasn't perfect, but we were able to do that. And like I said earlier, now they're coming to sessions and they've even invited their case manager, the caseworker from ACS, who was just in our office with them. So, you know, it, it's about listening um, to the young person and actually understanding what it is that they're experiencing, but also what they want. Um, Cause oftentimes, you know, um, they, they're just, meeting with folks who have a regular playbook that doesn't necessarily um, allow them to play the game and, and, and be winners in that game. 
very thoughtful comments. Thank you. I see a question, a hand up by our colleague on the committee, Sam Johnson. Sam? Hey, everyone. Hi, I'm sorry I couldn't introduce myself. My name is Samantha Johnson. I am a committee member. Um, I want to just make a comment as well as a question. Um, I have read and learned more about Los Lourdes, um in my work most recently. And I do really enjoy the fact that you all are coming and doing and providing this service in this pilot program. So I just really want to be able to express gratitude and, and hope that this really worked out. I do feel like this is an intentional plan um, for community members to really find out exactly what wraparound services truly look like. We were trying to really think about the child or the person um, to court support for young people when they're going. Most of the times we realize that young people don't have that type of support, peer support or community members until it's the last um, moment where they end up having a charge. Um, so in those moments for this particular pilot program, would you say, or would there be any type of moments where the young person will be able to have that type of support from this pilot program of being with the lawyer as well as the wraparound service program um, organizers? And Samantha, I, I just, you cut off a little bit. Can you say they will be with, um... So I was just asking if there was moments for court support. So as families come to the court and try to advocate for this young person with all of the services, is there also something in that framework with this pilot program to support the families as well as the young person if they're in the in space of going to court and needing that type of support? Absolutely. In fact, uh, and Esteban will probably jump in on this because we've had a few cases where we've had to go to court with the young person um, to provide them support. Um, there's also been cases where we're working with a young person um, and they may be, you know, um, picked up by the police and um, we have to call the police precinct and say, um, we have a, an attorney for this young person. We ask that you not question them and we ask that you give an opportunity for someone to show up um, who can take care of them. Right, so we find ourselves in in, in multiple situations where um, we can provide that level of assistance, but also, um, you know, not just a young person because that can be the situation for the family as well that they might be going through something that indirectly is impacting that young person, which then leads that young person to getting into a situation that they may not want to find themselves. Like for example, um, the young person that I'm talking about, you know, um, when his father came for the first time to our office we found out that he was dealing with joblessness and he didn't know what to do because he couldn't, you know, bring food home for his family and that all the kids, everyone's frustrated in the home because of these circumstances. So by the end of that meeting with him, he left with four bags of food because we got it from our food pantry and got him four bags of food. And he left with a promise to come back the next day with his resume um, and we would help him get a job. And he left that day with an interview and called us the next day and said he was hired. You know, so wow. these are the, again, the ways in which this program could be very different um, from everything else that's been done out there. Um, and, and, you know, I'm, I'm just hoping that we can prove that and, and make sure that it gets um, replicated across the city. Yeah, I just want to add yes. to that. Um, thank you, Juan, and uh, great questions all around. And, uh, but, and yes, Samantha, in terms of that, each youth um, are um, case managers. Um, I have to do two hours with with the youth every week and uh, like a court appearance is definitely something that would be part of it where we would want to be there, whether it's virtual or in person to support them if they wish, of course. Um, and one of the things that where Juan mentioned about like the, the, the navigator, um, uh, the social worker, um, the, the, there's no lawyer there, though, too. So that's the legal referral. Is something right. that we would be doing though, because um, we do know that 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 is its own, that has its own kind of um, uh, you know uh, outlook on things and their own uh, rules that need to be followed. Um, but part of that is also breaking that down among the family dynamic too, ex fully explaining what what these what this means, especially with the younger, because the younger you go, there's a lot of consent also that that is that is needed. Um, but yes, court court. Um, going to court and supporting the youth 
um, at that is 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 definitely allowed and and highly encouraged. Thank you. Excellent. Are there other questions from my committee or anyone on the board? I mean, I have a bunch, but I defer to my committee. Jump in or raise your hand. I see Alice again. Hi, Alice. Do you want to unmute? Um, you know, I'm I'm still a little bit. I I, I really I. I really appreciate the work that you're going to be doing. And I also appreciate how difficult this work is and how challenging for the staff. And uh, I'm not asking a question about that, but I, I you know, I, I know that the staff who will give so much of themselves will need support as well. And I'm really, um, the thing that I'm just really stuck on, right? It's now, let's imagine it's three years from now, right? That the pilot is finished and done. When, when we walk into uh, these, these, these buildings, these communities, what will we see that was left by your program? Like, is there, you know, this parent who you just spoke about, who came in and did this resume, is he gonna be like somebody who's gonna be at some point in a position to, um, you know, support other parents or to support other young people. Like I'm really looking, you know, I, I guess I'm, I am, I know you're going to do great work, but I'm always thinking. So when that funded work is done, where's the capacity of the community to carry that work on or to carry pieces of that work on? So I think one of the one of the things that we aim to do is number one, have families at the end of this that are empowered um, to understand the systems in their lives and how to navigate them. The problem now is if um, and and sorry because we were supposed to have through um, a PowerPoint for you guys, um, you know, through our other team, but they weren't able to make it tonight. But I, I just want you guys to envision, you know, a, a young person at the center of our work. And just think about all the systems in their lives. It can be ACS, it could be courts, it could be you know um, police, it could be um, you know um, uh, job insecurity, it could be food insecurity. Imagine all those things engulfing that young person and that family, and having to navigate all those systems and not really understanding how to do that. Um, and at the end of that, if you can envision them at that center and all those things around them just making them completely invisible where they don't mean anything, where they're not heard, where they're not seen. Our aim is to make sure that at the end of this, any family and any young person that comes through this program understands how to be their own best advocate, understand the systems in their lives, but also understand that um, they have a voice in determining how those systems impact them. And if we can do that and, and, and through some of our community outreach as well, educate everyone else that these systems are in your life and they're supposed to work on your behalf and not you have to do the extra work to help yourself. Um, that in itself will be the key that we want to leave behind, right? Uh, you know, we, we want to, you know, we can do it sooner. We'd rather someone or, you know, the community say, hey, we got this now. You, need, you can leave, right? That, that's, that's the end goal here. That's the end game where communities are so empowered that they say to us, we don't need you guys anymore. We got this. Um, and, and we know that that takes time because especially working at nights of developments, there's such a level of disinvestment. There's such a level of distrust because all the systems in their lives have failed them already um, that we just want to make sure that they understand that they can be their own advocates and that we'll help them through that process to understand how to navigate that. So I'm not sure if I answered the question completely, but um, you know that, that's one of the hopes that we, we have for this pilot. And and uh, yes, you did. I, I I I you know yes, you did. Like like absolutely. That you know I think that providing services is 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 good. Uh, but I think unless it goes along with creating capacity mm -hmm. in the community, like what you're doing then it's just really kind of um it's good in the short term but not really in the long in the long term and uh yeah i'm really 
I, I won't just thank you for your answer. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I see hands. Uh, I, I see Samantha and uh, Monique. Uh, Sam, I'm going to call on Monique first. Because, and then I'll call on Sam. So Monique Cumberbatch from the board. You had a question um, or a comment? Are you able to hear me? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, basically, I um, am a community board member. I have, I'm attending a church that is in the Ingersoll and Farragut neighborhood and was wondering if I could get a flyer so that I could make sure that it is advertised to the community um, at my church and maybe if possible to some of the tenant associations. So I'm going to put my um, email in the chat and if you could um, possibly provide me with a flyer. I definitely want to follow up with the, you know, the community to make sure they get the word out. Absolutely. Excellent. Thank you. We can, we can get that to you. And we also welcome, if you need us to go into that community and have a conversation, we'd love for that. Um, okay. The idea behind this is also to build community through educate, you know, education and, and sharing the resources. That's, that's part of what, you know, going back to what Ms. Ellis said, um, it's about building that capacity that we that we can put in place. Yeah, thank thank you, Mr. Cumberbatch. That's excellent uh, idea and work. Yeah, uh, I want to call on Sam. She spoke already, but she has her hand up. So yes, Sam I, I just wanted to echo um, the comment that Juan made about safe sustainability. I think there is. Far too many times we find ourselves where we're with programs and organizations that are not thinking in a holistic perspective. Um, and when, Ellis, when you mentioned about what's being left behind, I think it is the self-sustainability and relatability that community members who are impacted through trauma can really find themselves in a, in a space where they can trust uh, a system that is about community and centered and focused on that. And so Los Tudes and the WIC, they've done amazing work and, and been able to work alongside community members in very intentional ways and also providing other layers of support, whether it be housing or social services. So I really am excited about the organization coming to our side and partnering with the other organizations to kind of strengthen our community as a whole. So it was just a comment, but I do want to also um, echo what Ellis uh, mentioned as far as sustainability, but I really want to focus on community members sustaining and making sure they can uh, have the resources that they need so systems are not going to be um, used as much. But thank you. Thanks, Samantha. I see Nick's hand up. Before I call on you, I have one question that might be helpful, very concrete question. You discussed that meetings with the young person, with the family, is it in an office? Is it in their home? Where are these meetings? Because we know parents need local services. It's often impossible for them to go to other communities um, mm -hmm. for services. So, Yeah, uh, this is one of the reasons why it's, it's super hyper-local to the developments that we serve, um, because it, it can happen at the development. It can happen in their home. It can happen in our office. And to be quite honest, where is your office? Um, our central office is at 622 Broadway. Um, that's um, right down the um, Blafamoto Hospital, for those of you that are familiar mm -hmm. with the area. Yeah. Um, and or wherever they need to meet us, you know, um, and I say that to my staff all the time, you know, wherever they need us to go, that's where we're going to go um, because that's where their comfort level is. Um, and I want to make sure that, you know, their comfort level is first. Um, because if we can show them we, we're willing to go to them and meet them where they're at, then once they, um, again, begin to build that trust with us, then we can, you know, invite them to other places and other and other sites where they um, can expand also, you know, um, their kind of purview beyond their development, right? Um, because, you know, one of the things we've seen is that um, when folks are multi-system involved in particular and, and feel like they can't, you um, deal with the circumstances in, in their lives that they stick to that development and sometimes don't understand the many things that are available to them outside of that. So we also want to, you know, build that into this, to this model. I appreciate that. I see Nick's hand is up and somebody also with the initials JS, but I will call on Nick first. 
Yeah. Thanks. Real, real quick. Um, you mentioned I thought I heard like 135 young people. How, is that a is that a one location? So are we talking about 135 person caseload? What, what what's the caseload? It, it's a cross, and 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 Erica can also help if she wants to with this question. Um, because what they wanted to do is get a good enough sample to be able to see. Um, going back to what Ms. Ellis said earlier, how can we measure this completely? So this was the sample selected. Um, to make sure that when it's evaluated, we can say we can go to each family impacted and served and say these were the outcomes. Um, and again, um, it was intentional, um, a small sample so that we can um, really determine what the services were that were put in place or the services that were in place that we had to really um, rethink um, because um, maybe they weren't working for the young person and their families. So, so I just, sorry, I, I just want to be clear, because I, I think 135 is a lot when I think of a caseload, 135 as a whole project, sure, maybe it's not a lot. So the, the social worker, how many people can one social worker from that organization, how many would they be expected to work with? How many young people? Yeah, um, I would keep in and want an answer. Okay. Sure. Um, so we do have more than one social worker, uh, Los Sures, um will employ three social workers to support all of Brooklyn. And in Brooklyn, the number of families that the navigator, um, coordinator, and social worker will service is between 35 and 50 for Brooklyn. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Totally sounds doable. And, and so are you collecting data? I'm sorry. That's my last question because, you know, you're, you're talking about, you know, future and and I know you know this but that's the only way anybody ever is going to get funded and anything is ever sustainable the yeah. stories are good for the gala and we cry yeah. and a few people will pay you you know this yeah. but you need data 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 ongoing so are you are you doing that you have the capacity to do that do you need help yeah, with there, that there was there was this um and Esteban can probably chime in and Erica as well, but there's been a, a database established just to collect the data on this. Um, so navigator, um, case manager, and social worker are all entering data as they work with the young people um, with also being careful with what data they collect. Um, for safety sometimes, especially for the young people that are um, you know, criminal justice involved, we want to be safe, keep them safe. Um, but data is being collected. And we also, again, um, keeping everything that we do in the case conferences, um, you know, also measuring what happens with the other agencies that are supposed to be at the table with us um, is very important um, because one thing that this also will show is just how willing are these other agencies to, uh, you know, are to work toward helping a young person outside of their normal scope of work, right? Um, you know, so we, we, we look to collect all of that. Thank you. Excellent. I'd like, thank you. I'd like to call on JS. Can you identify yourself who you are? Uh, Welcome, yeah. Miss Julie. Hi, good uh, evening, everybody. This is Julie Sharpton in transit from Whitman Tenant Association uh, president. And I, how you doing? Um, Mr. Ramos, I did make contact with Frank from mm -hmm. Los Shores, if I'm saying that right. And yes. my question is, uh, and again, the same young men and my two of my young men express interest in having like a group sessions, monthly group sessions at our TA office. And we're really looking for somebody that might be able to facilitate that, if you will. Is that something that your organization is like a rap group? If you were like a group therapy, something similar to that, but where the kids can just come and let off some steam verbally and talk about whatever is important to them. Maybe, you know, um, you can kind of gauge what their needs are based on that and then branch out off of that. They, they're very comfortable in the setting of my office and uh, with each other. And is that something that's possible? Yeah, we, we can set up a session where we, we get to meet them and get to know them and see what the needs are. Um, that's definitely a possibility. And I think we, you and I spoke at the, at the uh, police council meeting um, and, and, and you had mentioned that. I said that, yeah, we definitely um, can try to do that. Wonderful. So, and about, I know that, where they're at, you know, 
Okay, awesome. And I know that Frank, him and I have made contact. So we're just going to set up a date where him and I and my board members can uh, do a little more formal meet and greet, if you will, and we'll try to take it from there. And thank you very much. I think what your organization is doing is awesome. It's needed. Um, there, is there anything you share that I don't agree with? And we got a great group of um, young adults here that we've been working with since last year, and they're open um, to this type of program and they're open to the help. And what we don't want to do is wait until, you know, we lose them by not following through, right? With what um, the needs of those kids are. And these are males um, that we're talking about. So I will, I, we do intend on moving forward with your organization and seeing what we can do to partner to enrich their lives and get them the help they need. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Miss. Thank you, Miss Julie. I want You're to welcome. see you at future uh, meetings. Uh, absolutely, you, know. you certainly will. Absolutely, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, okay, let me see if there are more questions from people. Um, you, Ms. Julie, you, oh, your hand was raised, okay. So I have um, another question. It relates to a previous meeting we had about um, that some of the attendance teachers in the district had concerns and they were talking about chronic absenteeism and so on. Um, have you connected with our district is district 13. Uh, as you know, district 13 only goes up to the eighth grade, the high school is in another division and we could facilitate that uh, conversation if you need to be introduced to someone, but we work closely with the District 13 office and the attendance teacher and principal, you know, they've been active in saying we need support for attendance. So since you deal with truancy, chronic absenteeism, it's very similar. What are your thoughts on how to make that connection, how you could work with the attendance teacher, maybe to get referrals or share ideas? Well, I just wanna be very, very um, clear that we deal with folks that may have truancy, but they have to have multiple system involvement. Um, so if truancy is the only thing, then we can try to provide some support, but it's not necessarily a person who fit the program description, um, but we definitely try to support. Because um, we want to make sure that we're dealing with pe young people that are dual system involved, and I, I welcome um, you know to do a presentation for District 13. Um, just a you know point mm -hmm. of um, uh, information. I used to be a, a member of the Community Education Council for oh, District cool. 13, so I'm very familiar, and I I appreciate the work that's being done there. So I welcome a, a presentation if we need to do that. So would you be interested in meeting, like with the leadership? of District 13, should we approach it that way? Or to the parent, the CEC council, where do you think your efforts should be focused? Either work for me um, and, and Esteban as well. Um, you know, but I think the, the key is um, to make sure that enough people know about it and understand it so that the referrals can be um, intentional and direct. Um, and if and if we can support um, allowing us an opportunity to take the information back, um, I, I don't believe in, in going anywhere and not leaving someone with at least something to, you know, um, be helped with. Because if we can't help, I want to find a way to connect people. Um, mm -hmm. So either way, you know, and any setting will be okay. I know Stephen wants to chime in. I see him. Chime, yeah, no, I in. just wanted to add, uh, um, Betty. I think um, as Juan mentioned, given the referrals. And also the sensitivity of, of the information. Meeting with with the group um, that that uh, of, around attendance support would probably be the best to begin with, um, and then branching from there. Because we do know that um, uh, chronic absenteeism uh, schools are mandated reporters, so they do need to send this information, which can trigger other you know in system involvements and stuff. Um, and and other there it could also be another indicator, you know. So. Um, Whatever we could do to meet with that group to 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 explain the youth services coordination, what we're trying to do, and, and see how we how we could support. Uh, and and as I'm sure you've already gathered from from what Juan has mentioned and Erica, like you know, even if somebody's not eligible for YFC, 
because of the malicious involvement, we would, that doesn't mean that we're just going to say, well, move on to the next, you know, we, 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 we still want to see how we could support them and, mm-hmm. and where there might be gaps that we could get them attention. Um, I'll only add to that is um, to say that we're, you know, we're, we're going to be very intentional and, and very um, careful that we never are in a position where we're adding systems to a young person's life. Um, the, the idea here is to either decrease the systems or help them understand and navigate those systems, but never to add systems to their lives. So, you know, we're going to be very intentional about, um, you know, fielding um, who we speak with and what the, what the intentionality is behind um, the request. Very, very thoughtful responses. So before we thank our, our presenters and their colleagues, is there anyone else from the board or the committee uh, to make a final comment or ask a question. Clarify, Bush, if I could, I just, and I don't want to put you on the spot, Ana Luisa, but I just wanted to recognize that uh, Ms. Ana Luisa from um, our, one of our two local council members is Crystal Hudson is um, with us tonight. And I may have just caught her as she was. <laughs> Ana Luisa. She's drinking, she's drinking her water, I think. <laughs> okay. Make sure that the council member's office gets your materials. Great. So you'll make sure that the materials too. And Ana, Ana Luisa, we were former colleagues and, and she was also at the at the um PSA at the PSA meeting too. So mm-hmm. great. Okay, so hearing no further comments or questions and we really thank you we think that this is a very promising approach we wish you the best with the young people and we will support your efforts and please come back to us and let us know what's happening you can always come to community forum we're the fourth wednesday of the month um or call the office and say you need to present because you want to give an update so It's all good. Thanks again. You can stay if you like. You can go and have dinner if you like. Whatever. Okay. Thank you all. We appreciate the the invite. Okay, great. Thank you. So since we changed the order of the agenda, I won't do a chair's report now. I know that the uh, folks are here from the um, Madison uh, Boys and girls, and they have an update for us, and we might have a discussion. So I see, let's see, I see Mr. Uh, McChristian and Mr. King. So would you like to start us off, and then we'll engage in a dialogue? Okay, great. Um, can you hear me okay? I. Mr. McChristian, we might want to just turn, there's yeah, there's a, can we turn your video off? Actually, that might improve the vocal. Okay. I, I, or actually try again. Maybe it was just a little glitch. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes, that's great. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, I guess I, my, my, I have a face for radio, I guess. <laughs> um, good evening. And without knowing any context of your background, awareness of what's going on. I asked Betty to share a press release with you. Um, maybe you can raise your hand if you've seen it. If not, I'll give you a short version of a five-year journey. I let me give the short version. I think version. some of us have um, seen it, yeah. Okay, let me, give the, let me give the short version. Obviously, I've been telling this story for almost five years now. I'm the executive director for Madison Square Boys and Girls Club. And Madison is one of the oldest boys and girls clubs in the country. It's been around since 1884 in New York City. We currently operate six clubhouses, three in Brooklyn, Brownsville. My Brooklyn Borough Director Stan King is also on. We also have two clubhouses in the Bronx and we built a $45 million showcase clubhouse in Harlem that's a couple of years old. Um, We are, one of the larger organizations in the country. This is what we do for a living. And obviously our brand has been a very strong one. I'm gonna give you a short version of a long, terrible story though. In August, 2019, you're probably aware that Governor Cuomo passed the Child Victims Act. And you saw it mostly 
around activities with the Catholic Church and Boy Scouts. It, it allowed historical cases of child abuse to be brought forward without any statute of limitations. We got pulled into it, unfortunately, because of a doctor who volunteered at our 29th Street Clubhouse in Lower Manhattan, which we no longer have. He volunteered from 1941 to 1985, um, Dr. Reginald Archibald. He was a world-renowned pediatric endocrinologist, childhood growth specialist at Rockefeller University Hospital on the Upper East Side. He volunteered at the clubhouse from 1941 to 1985. He was on our board from 1964 to 1985. And when the Child Victims Act window opened in August of 2019, 149 cases were brought forward of allegations of abuse. Over 90% were by Dr. Archibald. Um, starting in 1948, going up through 1984. This has been a terrible exercise and journey. Our board has been resolute from day one. We want to respect the claims of the victims that have come forward, but also protecting the programs that we're delivering at our clubhouses to kids who need us now more than ever. And obviously this was during COVID also. So we've been working through this bankruptcy. Well, we've been working through the whole negotiations process and it's a very expensive process. As I said, Madison is not a small startup. We've been around, we had over a hundred million dollars in net assets, $12 million annual budget, including a $60 million endowment. We spent $22 million of our money in litigation expense to date. We knew where we were headed with the spending, and so we filed for Chapter 11 restructuring bankruptcy on June 29th of last year in order to bring a resolution to the table to try to get this resolved, and we got a mediator appointed. So we've been in mediation since last June with the Plaintiffs' Council, um, 141 plaintiffs represented by eight law firms, two law, three law firms have 80% of the uh, victims along with Rockefeller University Hospital, the insurance companies, Boys and Girls Club of America were all so named, even though they really have nothing to do with it. And it's a terrible process and the best cutting off an arm to save a body. And that's what this negotiation has been. Uh, the plaintiffs came in with what's called a scorched their strategy. They would have been basically saying, no, you cannot have our restricted endowment. No, you cannot have our $45 million clubhouse in Harlem. Um, no, you cannot have my foundation, which is a separate 501c3. Oh, they said, okay, they what the boys and girls part. Pardon? Are they Hello? Can you guys still hear me? hear me? Yeah, you're fine. It was somebody else accidentally off mute. Okay. Um, and so we've been in negotiations, and the plaintiffs have been demanding a cash figure. And obviously, as I said, we spent all of our cash, $22 million of cash has gone out. So we have not had any cash left. All we have is a real estate. We had four clubhouses outside of the Harlem clubhouse. And obviously appraisals have been done multiple times over this three year process. And the clubhouse, unfortunately, that fit the financial requirements of the plaintiffs is the Navy Yard clubhouse. And that's really the background of how we got here. It's a very short version of a very long story. Um, it's not anything I said we want to do. What we have to do is save our organization and get out of bankruptcy. And so the filing we made on April 12th was when this negotiations became public. That was where we announced we're giving $2 million in cash at settlement, a $5 million note to the plaintiffs, the insurance claims, because insurance should be contributing. They just haven't. We cannot afford to continue to chase insurance claims against Rockefeller University Hospital because they were his employer. And that was the only reason he was a volunteer with us is because he was a doctor world renowned at Rockefeller. So those, we are also giving those claims to the plaintiffs and we're giving the proceeds from the sale of the Navy Yard. Um, just to give you a little context, the estimated value is between 12 and $18 million. The original negotiation was 15 million that they said they want a guarantee for. And if it sold for 15 million, they would get all of that. If it sold for 10 million, for example, they would want us on the hook for the, for the difference of five. So I'm, I'm giving you an example of the type of negotiations we've been in over this period where we got them to back away from the actual committed value of the property and whatever it sells for, 100% of the proceeds will go to the plaintiffs. 
in return for this settlement coming out of our filing on April 12th, the creditors will now have to approve the settlement terms. If they do that, the bankruptcy court will give us releases from this historical litigation. So we think that's gonna take a couple of months. The alternative, if the court does not approve the settlement, if the creditors do not approve it, is liquidation of the entire Madison organization. So this is a very intense process. There is no you know, glamor to it other than trying to literally save a 140-year-old organization. Unfortunately, in the Navy Yard, and that's actually the focus of this call, is the <laughs> asset that we're required to um, give up in order to come to settlement. Once it's put on the market, I just spoke to Cushman Wakefield, they're our commercial realtor. It should be on the market by the end of the month. Then, or, I'm sorry, by the end of this week, it will open up to whoever wants to buy it. And I, there's, I've had discussions with multiple people about angel investors. Somebody wants to come in and buy it and give it back to the Boys and Girls Club for a dollar a year, I'd love to take it. A developer can come in and build a 20 story affordable housing, and give the first three floors to a Boys and Girls Club. You know, we've seen that model work. Um, so that is a separate transaction from the settlement that we filed. Um, before I open up the question, let me add one more point though. We are committed to remaining in the Navy Yard area. And so we're already having conversations with DYCD because we have a three-year contract and the contract is not limited to the, that location. So we're exploring other locations in the Navy Yard area that we could possibly continue to run our programs. And that includes both private and public um, properties that we're already in discussion with. I don't have anything firm that I'm gonna announce but we are not, you know, our intent is to remain relevant in that community that we know needs us. And we're, again, looking at ideas and options right now um, that will allow us to do that outside of the brick and mortar facility. So that, again, that's a short version of a story that you can imagine as you hear me tell it. I've told it a lot in a lot of different versions of giving you the short crib note version. Um, and I'll open it up for questions. Yeah, um, before we, thank you so much. Uh, we know it's a difficult time for you and for your organization and for the young people in your care. Uh, before I open it up to questions, I'd like some comments either from you or Mr. King regarding where are we at for the after school children, for the clubhouse children, for the summer youth employment children, you know, for the different groups. Yeah, let me handle. Yeah, so let me address that. We are an after school program. So all of our kids are after school. Uh, we serve kindergarten through 12th graders. What we announced originally on May 12th, or I'm sorry, on April 12th, was we were gonna close on May 12th. The update I gave on Friday is we're going to extend through the end of the school year for K through eight. So business as usual between three and six o'clock, which are the standard hours for the younger kids, we will continue that through the end of the school year. For teenagers, who I always say they vote with their feet, they don't have to come in the clubhouse, they can go in wherever they want, we hope they come in. We're gonna to pivot to virtual programming on May 12th for the remainder of the school year. Uh, one of the learnings of COVID is there are certain programs that work fairly well uh, virtually and we know what those are. We're gonna survey the teens for some additional program needs, but that's the plan for the remainder of the school year. We are not gonna be running a summer camp program at that clubhouse because again, the sales process is beginning now. We don't know when it will actually happen. And there's a whole child safety policy or process that we're very concerned about with the sales process. So right now we, are, we will be running through the end of the school year, which is June 27th for the younger kids. I see. Um... What has the discussion been with the DOE and the school that's next to it? I have no discussions. I have no discussions with them other than with DYCD now where we're looking at alternate space. PS 287 is the school right next door and um, DYCD is speaking to them to see if they may have space for us. My priority, I got to be very direct and very good. My priority right now is on the bankruptcy settlement and taking care of the current kids at the clubhouse and their families as we kind of wind through the, the rest of the school year. Um, Stan is my point person for looking at alternative sites. And again, we have meetings tomorrow um, at some sites in the neighborhood. So we're, we're running multiple plays, but right now we're still trying to understand the next steps of the bankruptcy process to ensure we can get out of it. And 
while also looking at alternative sites for programming moving forward. Thank you. I see several hands raised. I'd like to ask uh, Lisa Scott and then Samantha. Lisa? Hi, thank you for the presentation. Um, I just had a really quick question as to why the Boys and Girls Madison one was selected as the one to sell. Um, okay, then, is, uh, let me correct your question. Madison is the parent organization. We have six clubhouses. I think you meant to ask why Navy Yard? Yes, thank correct? you. Thank you for clarifying, yes. Yeah. Okay, the reason, as I mentioned, we did appraisals on all the properties. Interesting enough, three of our other four properties that we looked at all have New York City usage restrictions. We've gotten city money over the years to repair a roof or a pool. So they have usage restrictions that you just can't sell them to anybody. Or you can't sell them to a developer to build million dollar condos. You can only sell it to a like use um, program. Navy Yard did not have those restrictions. So even though it's actually, I think our smallest clubhouse in terms of square footage, it has the highest market value, which again, met the demands of the plaintiffs for their dollar figure. But I, <laughs> I have to have some humor in this, otherwise I would go absolutely crazy. I won't entertain a discussion that says, which of your kids do you like the least though? And so I, the same time, I, I had the same, I did a parent session last Tuesday of all our parents. We had 27 parents in person and I think about 25 on the phone and a similar discussion that says, I can't allow you to expect me to have this discussion with the parents in the Bronx or in Harlem telling them that, you know, their clubhouse is gone. You know, you have to almost accept the, finality of the selection of the clubhouse we made it's not personal but it's one you know it's, it's a location that had to be selected in order to meet the demands of the uh, settlement thank you i see samantha has her hand up hello thank you for the presentation tim um i have a question in regards to well, well, a comment in regards to the statement of cutting off the arms to save the body with those who are actually community members of this place the arm is our community, so it hurts us. Um, and I understand that this is a difficult decision for bankruptcy, but you're definitely saving a company and an, and an organization more so than anything else. So my question is um, for the acquisition of the building, what are you making any conscious decisions for the companies that are going to be trying to buy this building? Um, and seeing exactly how to be more conscious about the community that the needs are? No, um, it is a free market sale through Christian Wakefield because the plaintiffs have made very clear they want to maximize the yield from the sale of that asset. So I just want to repeat, so you're not making any conscious decision on who buys the no, building? No, we are not allowed anybody. to. We are not allowed to buy the plaintiffs. The plaintiffs have demanded a dollar figure that they expect from that facility and they're now allowing any restriction to be put in place to limit the value that they expect to extract from the transaction. And well, I have a last question, Betty. And so with that being said, with the proposals that have been given to you about angel investors and other things, are you in consideration for that at all? Or you're trying to just, I just wanna make sure that I'm clear that you don't mind selling it to a developer because you just need the money. Well, again, it's not on the market yet. We're the way that I don't want to bring you into my world unless you want to go, but we're about to go deep. If you want to understand the process. That's yes, fine by me because I'm a, representing the community. So I'd rather do that. Thank okay. you. Okay. There is a trust, a compensation trust committee that is owning the sales process. So they will actually be the front to look at all bids. They are represented they are representing the plaintiff's interest. They will look at all bids. So an angel investor wants to come in and do great things. They will look at that and compare it to any other bids and, and make their decision. So we are not, again, when I say we, we are Madison, we are only the front end of the process. The ultimate owner of the transaction is the compensation trust. And they'll look at all, again, they will look at all bids. Thank you. I think I saw a hand of Leroy, but I don't see it anymore. Did you have a question, Leroy? 
No, it was it, it was just answered. I just wanted to see if there was discretion regarding the sale of the building, but it sounds like it is the highest offer or mm -hmm. um, that needs to be accepted. So that's all cleared up. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Nick. Yes, thank you. Um, I was just curious what the um, the funding was through DYCD. What type of contract is supporting the after school uh, services? We have fifth. Well, I'm not sure what type. It's an after school contract. It's for 50 mm -hmm. kids, 30, 30 kindergarten through six, and 20 juniors. So it's about $150,000. Uh, actually, we're servicing more kids at that clubhouse, but that is an existing contract. That we're looking to see if we can maintain at another location in the area that, as I mentioned, um, BYCD is helping us to identify. Okay, thank you. And so, so this is st maybe Stan. I don't know if you're the right person. Then, if it sounds like you're in this space, so is this a Compass contract? Uh, and who? Okay. And what is D who? What is DYC doing for you? I do this for a living, so I'm, I'm well, very so clear of what you're trying you. to do. So I, I'm you concerned. <laughs> What's going on? Thanks. We've been in conversation with J. Lou. Uh, from DY City, Tracy Cauldron, who is the uh, deputy commissioner, uh, and they are looking for alternate spaces. Um, they've exerted, you know, they're going to di different um, uh, schools within the community to try and see if there's availability for space to partner uh, with them. Um, you know, I think one of the things is that there are existing programs within those schools already, and so we're just having those conversations on, you know, you know if there is a possibility to get into a school. Um, and, and really just to echo Tim's sentence while I have the floor, it was a very, very painful process. You know, I've been with the organization for 27 years and I've literally seen kids grow up in the community, grow up at that clubhouse. Uh, now their kids are now going to that clubhouse. So it's been very, very generational in terms of our approach and what we with these families. And to, uh, one, to be uh, in a circumstances where the current members by no fault of their own are losing such a valuable resource has been very, very painful. Uh, there's been a series of, you know, meetings and, you know, conversations with staff and parents. Uh, but the most painful is the, the members because the members are, you know, really, you know, given their, their stance on, you know, like, wow, this is really, really messed up. Like, like they're, they're taking, you know, something that they really, really enjoy away. Um, the conversation definitely has, you know, even you know, further instilled the, the, the passion on getting back in the community. And so we're making every efforts to do that. Thank you. And, and are they, I mean, are there any prospects? You know, do you feel like there are schools interested in you working out minor details or does it feel like we're at step one here? I think right now it's step one in terms of entering the schools, uh, again, on our behalf, DYC is having those conversations with principals and uh, their existing schools within their portfolio to see exactly you know, where would be a good fit. Um, there, I think there are some leads in terms of uh, you know trying to you know, find a space, uh, but again, very very preliminary right now. Thank you. Appreciate it, and good luck, of course. Is Sam still on the call? Sam, I know you've been following this issue very closely. Do you have any further questions uh, for our speakers before I thank them and, and move on? I'll well, the all last I word. have to say, I appreciate it, Betty. Thank you. And thank you to the representatives from the organization. This is a passion project, not a project, but it's my community. So I take it deeper than just an acquisition and a purchase and a sell. These are young people. We had a rally in front of your facility, to which I also found out that you called the police on us because you was, you know, precaution. So, and, but also being mindful that our community is very networked. So we already knew what was going on and we did a piece of protest. But I just want to be able to say that to those who are listening in the, in this space that we know that the Navy Yard is going to make a decision to purchase and, I mean, to sell this property. We can't hold the Navy Yard accountable for things that they're not necessarily literally accountable for when it comes down to allegations and, and, and being able to do what they need to do to save their company. What I would hope that those who are on this call can do is try to reach out to local community members who are literally seriously fighting to save the property, to maintain it as a community center, and for it not to be a high rise. 
The reason why for the Navy Yard, they may or may not know this, is that we are dealing with a gentrification issue where most of the buildings are in our Fort Greene area within 11201 and 11205 are being top high rises with displacement of black and brown people, as well as over policing. And so when you build into a community that's literally across the street from a NYCHA facility, you bring on other issues. And I understand you have to make a sale because that's all you have to do. But the discretionary aspects that you could at least offer to those plaintiffs that are equally going through some trauma and issues would be a very great idea so that you can at least bring some compassion and and, and argue that this community needs to maintain a space that's not a high riser, that is not something that's going to dis dismantle our communities for years to come. You're doing this now, but we have to also look at the 20 and 30 and 40 years afterwards when our communities no longer look like us or even behave the way that we would like it as a synergy in an infinity circle. So I just wanna be able to say, the community members are really mobilizing and they're reared up to try to push back and put all of our those who are accountable into the space to have a deeper conversation to ensure that our communities remain in the space of wellness, love and careness. Um, and hopefully that is remnants in your other facilities that you bring this back so that you can be more intentional when you're making decisions like this. So thank you so much. And Samantha, again, I appreciate and in full transparency, I called Dorian, who organized the community protest on Tuesday, to inform him that I'm going to invite the police simply because it's a public protest in an area next to um, where we had kids in the building. So there was no surprise on his part. But anyway, the point you're making is a valid one. However, and I'm going to be very transparent with you. Let me remind you of this process. The plaintiffs were all former Boys and Girls Club kids. So throughout this exercise, we reminded them of the impact on today's kids who look, you know, they don't necessarily look like the, our kids now, but they were kids who benefited from what we offer many years ago, and they had no compassion. That's my only point I want to make. We have constantly reminded the plaintiffs of the impact on today's kids in the same clubhouses they were in 40 or 50 years ago in some cases, and there was a zero compassion. So while I understand, believe me, um, as a black man, I understand the impact very well of what's, what's happening. I will tell you that the plaintiffs have not been receptive to any type of compensation or compassion for today's kids. They want to get paid and God bless them for what they, you know, what they suffered. And again, we respected them from day one on their claims, but they have not exhibited any compassion to help us navigate uh, through this terrible situation. And Tim, I thank you for that. And I, I, this is not going to be a back and forth answer. I promise, Betty, I'm not going to cover your meeting. I understand that. But when we're dealing with individuals with trauma, this deeply rooted, I'm not asking for anyone to give one person an opportunity to kind of foresee their trauma. Like their trauma is valid. It's real. It's deep. And it's something that a million dollars is never going to heal. So I'm just saying that in this process that as they're, somewhat advocating for your company that when you're looking at the realtors and you're thinking about private institutions, when you're thinking about a LDC, when you're thinking about all of these options to really try to see what you can build with community. It may not necessarily be with the realtor. It may not be with any other uh, uh, form of the capacity building, but you do need to figure your accountability to our area. And if you leave, that's perfectly fine. But community members will still mobilize and we still will galvanize our voices so that we can be heard with all elected officials, with all of the other parties who can be involved, who really do want to save this space for our community. So I appreciate your your thoughts, and but I also feel that for a community member, as a NYCHA resident, as a person of color, as a person who also has gone through trauma, it is imperative for us to continue the fight. So I thank you very much. Mr. McChristian, could, yes. could, you, could you please remind the committee, what was what is the total amount that was stated in favor for the plaintiffs? It's not fully public, but if you piece it all together, it's about $25 million. So is it correct that the sale of this building is expected to cover that $25 million settlement? No, I, I, I go over the math again. We are giving $2 million in cash upon exiting of chapter 11, hopefully in about two months, a $5 million note, the proceeds of the insurance claims, which is a value to be determined, but it could be significant. The proceeds from the claim, University, which again, 
could be significant and the proceeds from the sale of the Navy Yard Clubhouse, which has an estimated value between 12 and 18 million. Thank you. Okay, I think we've exhausted our questions from our uh, audience, our board members. So I thank uh, Mr. McCushion, Mr. King. Um, and in summary, I mean, we, we feel for the situation all around, but we're mostly concerned with the young people who have been participating in the clubhouse yeah. and are losing an important support to their growing lives. Well, Betty, what so, I would like to add, just in return for the opportunity to join you tonight is to keep you updated because I am, my glass is always half full. I am optimistic about our opportunity to identify other opportunities to continue programming in the Navy Yard area for some, if not all of our current and future um, youth who need us more than ever. Um, I'm not gonna again, wave my hands around the facility. If it's not that facility, it'll be another facility, but our programs are our programs, regardless of the brick and mortar that it's in. And so we're gonna continue to pursue, as Stan said, alternative sites, so we can continue to offer uh, the programs that are needed now more than ever, and we'll keep you updated on that. Thank you. So as I said earlier, we meet the fourth Wednesday of every month. I'm sure Taya can send you our agenda and Zoom link. And even if you're not an official presenter, you can always speak in community forum. We would welcome that because we care very much about what how this is all playing out, you know, the next steps and so on. Oh, Lisa okay. asked if you can put your contact information in the chat. I think Taya can. It's on, isn't it on the press it. release, I think? I think well, it well, should be on well, the press we'll, release. But I, we'll make I'll sure. put it in. OK. Great. Thank you. So you can stay or you can go and have dinner or whatever. Uh, we have a few more procedural items on our agenda. So okay. again, thank you. OK. Thank you. Um, so for the chair report, I wanted to talk a bit about our health fair, I've mentioned that in prior meetings, the plans are coming along very nicely for June 10th uh, in Commodore Barry Park. Um, there'll be a panel discussion and you know some electeds will speak of course, and there'll be various booths from hospitals and other healthcare organizations. Um, it's from 11, I think to four. So I really hope, of course, that every committee member can come and help. So the help could be in different ways. Like if you have an idea for a table or something, but if you're not sure and you just wanna be there, I am getting 200 free new books from the Brooklyn Book Bodega. They spoke to us pre-COVID. I remember meeting them in person and I've had them uh, give books to some of the other events I've done in the community. So I'm gonna have a table giving out books to people. So if someone wants to just come for an hour and aren't sure of their role at this fair, this outdoor fair, can help give out books to kids and adults. We're getting books for all ages, not just the little ones. And we always ask kids, what do you like to read? What do you, what was your favorite thing that you read? You know, to help match a book uh, to a child because the notion is that every child should have books at home and books that they choose. Sometimes I've had situations where mothers have said, this is the book you get. And I've very gently re redirected them and said, let, you know, the book is for free. <laughs> let them choose a book they really like. So I welcome any and all of you to help with my book distribution. Okay, so that's June 10th. And if there are any other ideas, for that day, I know that last year, Nick did great photography. Are you bringing your camera again this year? He's smiling. I might, I don't know. I wasn't, I wasn't invited. I'm being a little, I'm, I'm feeling a certain way. Um, so, <laughs> but I'm around. I'm inviting you. Okay. Um, okay, so I also wanted to, re oh, Taya wrote, you're invited. <laughs> uh, this we've talked on and off about the Albee Square School 
that was supposed to open in the September, but it's going to be a high school for two years until it gets to be the elementary school that it's supposed to be. And there will be a planning group to help um, conceptualize like the theme of the school. Um, it's probably not going to be a zone school. It might be a magnet school or a lottery school. So there'll be more on that. And uh, I anticipate an opportunity for some of us to participate with the planning. Uh, and in terms of our committee business and uh, on the board, we're gonna soon be starting to look at our statement of district needs. And I really think we haven't had like that many presentations or issues that have come before us this year that we've had in, in the past. But if everyone could think of like one or two things that you wonder about or see a need within the realm of youth education and cultural affairs, and that each one of us uh, agrees to do a little research uh, to find out more so that we can try to be more effective in writing these statements so that we can get city resources um, to, to the various uh, programs. Uh, I, I've discussed with Sam about figuring out what's going on at the Farragut Community Center. And maybe uh, Sam or maybe someone else can help figure out who are the people there who could come and speak to us about the conditions there, what programs are there, and so that we can more effectively advocate. We've ad advocated for renovation. We've advocated for a new gym floor because we heard, that we heard and saw that the gym floor was in a uh, very bad shape and not safe for kids to play. So uh, anything along those lines that people can bring to this committee, I, I think would be very effective. Was there a comment to that? I saw somebody's hand go up and it came down very quickly. Yeah, hi, it's Julie Sharpton again. So um, I just wanted to share that we are in the, we were beginning stages of trying to put together what a, a community center and recreational area, outdoor recreational area could look like at Whitman houses where the only one of the developments that doesn't have that. So unfortunately we don't have a lot of space to offer the um, for programming in lieu of the, the Navy are closing, but we certainly are willing to do anything we can to work with, you know, um, everyone to try and, you know, um, facilitate as much as programming as we can, even from my office, as tiny as it is. So with that mm -hmm. being said, while everybody continues to advocate here and there, you know, we would certainly appreciate it. Any support that could be lent on our end to helping push that vision for us to have a community center here at Whitman, because of course that would help. And it's unfortunate because we know, as as we've said, we've heard many times, and it to be true, that the um, Navy Yard Boys and Girls Club was a neutral zone, right? When it came to um, some of the uh, gang violence and, and so forth, where mm -hmm. Whitman, Ingersoll, and Farragut was concerned. So uh, just, just wanted to share that. And, and again, anything that anybody could do that we can continue to help um, of, uh, assist us with our agenda of, of finding a, a, per a permanent space, if you will, not just for Whitman residents, but our communities at large, we appreciate it as well. And we do have that vision here at Whitman Houses. Thank you. Uh, I hope you continue to come to our meetings. I think you have a lot to say. And then offline, I'll continue this conversation with you. Um, I'm sure Taya must have your contact information and we will continue this. And please come every fourth Wednesday. Uh, we want to hear more. Miss Julie, hi, it's Taya. Um, I definitely would like to work with you to get make sure that this is included in the first round of recommendations for the next CD needs. We'll be starting that this summer. Absolutely, I look forward. I put my uh, contact information in the chat. I'll post my number as well. And I look forward to partnering with everyone here, not just for the needs of Whitman, but listen, we're really just one huge community. So thank you and I look forward to it. And we appreciate you. Okay, uh, do I see any hands? Are there any further comments? I see Nick's real hand, not his virtual hand. Okay. Yes, Nick? I'm using my, my real hand. Uh, question about um, 
it, what you all think about maybe inviting some of our past speakers to the health fair with the intent of <clears throat> connecting folks to services. So I think about, um, you know, at, at the last meeting with that, we had principal and um, attendance folks from, from CEC. I didn't know if being able then to see all of like last year, there was Gotham Health um right and and northwell and all these providers and hospitals is something i know that came up for them from um they thought it would help their families maybe with chronic absenteeism obviously health is one of the biggest impacts of 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 anything for anybody's inability to be um i guess successful in life right so i just think that there's even today's presenters right? That, that mm -hmm. If all of a sudden there's schools there and, and they've got 30 slots for young people struggling, that seems like an amazing, um, you know, ability to be literally in the community as citizens are walking around and, and sort of um, we can make connections or they can make their own connections. So I didn't know what you all thought about that. I appreciate that. I wonder, Tay, could you produce, I know that uh, you weren't assigned to help in the uh, health fair because you have so much, and I, I appreciate that. So, could you give us a list of uh, and uh, for the committee for Brandon's committee, and they could invite the people? I'm not asking you, to, you know, to send out invitations. Um, I'm not sure I understand. Oh, Nick, Nick, can you, can Nick you suggested that we contact past speakers like this year's and maybe last year's past speakers to specifically invite them to the health fair. And I know we were told that um, that wasn't one of the things that oh, you- Oh, I see. Yes, I can make sure that Brandon gets a contact list of the previous speakers. Perfect, thank you. I'm and, sorry I didn't and explain I, that well. I would just add, no, I, you know, I'm also happy like to, if I have a flyer, I'll invite like today's folks and last, ones i mean they don't know brandon so that's like a cold sort of invite that probably isn't going to get as much traction so i'm i'm willing to volunteer to do that but i don't have any materials to do that if with. you hold on one second i think we have a, a brand new flyer out of the presses one second <laughs> awesome. yeah and also we're going i i said i would visit the four schools that are closest by one day i have to figure out a day sometime in may that i'm around and then I'll just shoot an email to everyone on the committee. And if you have a few minutes, I definitely know the principal at 287. We all do. She's spoken with us. And then I want to go to three. Is it 305 or 307? The one um, down there. I always confuse the numbers. But uh, the one across the street from Farragut and 67 and the Susan McKinney. So I will go there personally. And I would love any of your um, participation. It's during a school day, I know people are working, but yeah, that's what we're doing for the health fair. Um, okay, so that's the end of my chair report and discussion. Um, so I'm asking for any other business to come before this committee, anyone you'd like us to invite any further thoughts miss Annalisa um, has her hand up no yeah. who does i don't oh anna sorry my computer is really wonky at the same time i'm trying to like i'm sorry i don't know is this a, is this the best time to do is this like open comments or did i get ahead yes of yes this okay, is okay, make sure. you're on Okay, and thank you for joining us. Of course. Yeah. So I want to introduce myself. So I'm Anna Luisa. I'm the Director of Constituent Services and Community Engagement for Councilmember Crystal Hudson. I know usually Andrew Wright joins the meetings because he's assigned to uh, CB2. He has nothing but great things to say about the community board. And I'm sad. I'm, I'm excited to be joining you all for the first time. Um, this was actually a very, very uh, important meeting. And I want to thank... Um, I, if I mispronounce your name, I'm, say, I'm sorry, Taya's uh, invitation to join tonight's uh, meeting because our office is also as concerned as Samantha is about the closing of the Madison's uh, Boys and Girls Club. It's something that's very, very important to us as well. And we've had many of the similar, the same questions that Samantha has asked as well. So it's great to have a rep from the Madison Boys and Girls Club. And definitely we'll keep, um, on, we'll definitely be on top of the situation as well. Um, and, you know, as summer is approaching, as, as folks are very concerned on the lack of quality programming.
for the youth. And this is such an immense loss to not just the youth, but just overall the community itself. So um, if there's any, if you know of any upcoming events or any groups that you would like us to either have any kind of outreach to, to see what they're planning to do. I know that a lot of our part, our community partners um, on your end are planning a lot of events and definitely we'll share that to you all to share with your network. And definitely we'll share, and I'll make sure that Andrew shares any updates that any upcoming events we're having, we're planning to have an older adult resource uh, fair on your end. So definitely we'll share that with you all. And of course, just because it's an older adult does not mean it's not intergenerational. So definitely we'll make sure to share that with you all with our partners as well. Um, and of course, I know I hear that your, your, your team is doing a health fair and there's any way or any resources I can provide or our team can provide as well, let us know. We would love to share the flyer with our network. We do have a newsletter that goes out weekly. So if that's something that you would want us to do, we would love to promote it. Uh, I'm sure people, the weather is getting nicer. I'm sure folks want to be out. I can't wait to be outside and get some sunlight myself. Unfortunately, it's, I lost the opportunity earlier today. I'm about to go home soon and definitely missed out on that. But if there's any, just know that uh, the top line is that I definitely am happy to have shared the space with you all this evening and had these really important conversations, especially earlier with the new provider that's coming in. Um, definitely, and especially and Julie and I have had this conversation before. I think we spoke about, I spoke to Julie Sharpton from Whitman Houses about the, these same conversations last night. So definitely, this is definitely important to us. Um, and if there's anything I can be helpful with, I'll definitely put my contact information, especially my cell phone number. I'm here as a resource to you all. And you know, thank you for having me and giving me the opportunity um, to speak to you all today. And if there's any thank, questions, please let me know as well. Thank you. We, we appreciate your presence and of course the council members work. Mm -hmm. And I think the role in promoting the health fair will be very helpful. And I know from sitting on the committee with Brandon that the electeds have been invited you know, to speak, I think, to uh, kick off the event and there'll be a panel. But uh, Mr. Smith did say that the electeds were invited or will be invited. So uh, yeah, it'll be great. Save the day. we Will do. I'm looking forward to it. Okay. And one other thing for my committee before I ask for a motion. Um, I didn't ask for a secretary tonight. I know that's been a tense little area. Nobody likes being secretary. I will take the minutes tonight, but um, I really, we, we really need a secretary for the committee. It's a lot of tension for people to say, well, will I have to do this tonight or not? And, you know, people have things going on. So can you give me a hint? Do we set up a rotation at the beginning of the year and you know your month? I always ask for volunteer, if anyone wants to be a secretary, it's part of the leadership of the committee and we would welcome that. But if nobody has the time, you know, I don't want to pressure people, of course. So what are your ideas about how I fulfill this need? <coughs> I don't see many ideas. Okay. So this is I, like when they're like, well, Betty, you, you, you gotta give a little wait time. This is like when they look away when the teacher, right? Everybody's hoping they don't get called on, You're giving them too, making it too easy. Um, I vote for you assigned people and we all have to do it once and that's that. It's no one saying yes. And that's just the way it's been. So uh, I, I make don't a think schedule it's... for the year. That's so it. That that's it. And I don't think it's appropriate to tell somebody the night of they got to do it. So you I, know what? I made it's... an error. Yeah. No, no, I it's, and I'm sorry. I don't mean to even call you out on that. That's not what I meant to do. I just think it's I, I appreciate it. Somebody who did this uh for many years it's it's a lot of work but it's also i mean i learned a lot but i don't think anybody's signing up for it so i think we just create a list mm -hmm. and people will No, I, I realize that that it's very difficult for people to be told the day of or the night of so i will do that i believe we're getting new members uh it'll be announced either in may or june i'm not sure when and then when we have all the members we'll take their names and put them in for a month and that'll be that and I thank you for the support on that. Yeah. So is there a motion? Oh, Taya has the new roster. Uh, she's saying, so we're going to be getting the name soon, it sounds like. OK, announcement soon. Eight new members. That doesn't mean for our committee. That means maybe one, two for our committee. Who knows? 
everyone wants land use, but we are fabulous. So what can I say? Is there a motion to adjourn? Uh, Leroy is making, and what time is it? I have to put this in the minutes. Uh, 7.40. Like se 7.40, and uh, do I have a second? Rachel, thank you, Rachel, okay. So the meeting is adjourned. Thank you for your time. Have a great dinner. See you next time.